like a, you wanted to talk about Graham Hancock a little bit in ancient archaeology, uh, 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 so-called alternative archaeology, and the site of Gobekli Tepe. Well, we did a whole article in Skeptic on this. Very interesting. And it's interesting for, for mainstream scientific reasons, because allegedly monumental architecture has to be built by so-called advanced civilizations with large populations that have a division of labor, agriculture, uh, metallurgy, or advanced stone tool use, and uh, and and have you know a, a large enough population to make something that massive. So here at Gobekli Tepe, you have a pretty impressive uh, structure of you know tens of these stones that weigh tens of tons that you know a couple a couple dozen people couldn't do uh, seemingly. And but this was you know eleven thousand years ago, so this is many many thousands of years before agriculture really took off to the point where there was a division of labor and large populations living in cities that would give you the labor to construct something monumental like that. So how did they do it? You know, of course now the ancient alien people are all excited about this. Graham is not one of those. He just he just thinks that there was an advanced terrestrial civilization, not extraterrestrial. They live many tens of thousands of years before um, our current understanding of when the first civilizations were. And that they're, they're the ones that taught the hunter-gatherers how to do this. So the point is that this, this thing was, the, these structures at Gobekli Tepe were made by hunter-gatherers who we know lived in small uh, communities of a couple dozen to a couple hundred people, not enough to move around those massive stone tools. So we think. My response when I read about it was, well, maybe we're just wrong about what hunter-gatherers can do. Maybe they're smarter and more sophisticated than we thought they were. And so why not start with that rather than, again, going to the extraterrestrial or super advanced ancient civilization? Because once you go down that route, if that's true, what else has to be true? There's another skeptic principle. If there was an advanced civilization that lived, say, 30,000 years ago, which is what Graham thinks. Okay, where is their trash? Where are the homes? You know, where are their stone tools or metal tools? Where's their writing? Now, Graham's response to that is they didn't have any of that because that's not what I mean by advanced. I mean, you know, mentally advanced or psychically advanced or wisdom advanced. Okay, but that's that's not how archaeologists use that word advanced. They mean something else. You know, having an alphabet and and a calendar and and uh, you know, metal tools, things like that. So I think that the real story of Gobekli Tepe and the mystery there is that we, we underestimated the power and intelligence and skills of ancient peoples. And, and that principle right there goes a long ways to answering all those ancient alien um, questions that began with um, Van Donneken, you know, Chariot of the Gods, and that launched an industry, a publishing industry, and then a, a, a kind of search search the world for anything spooky and weird and mysterious that you can't explain. And again, be, just because you can't explain it doesn't mean that there isn't some archaeologist or art historian or something like that. You know, this the I, I really want to like the Ancient Aliens uh, TV series on the History Channel, but it's just painful to watch. They never have they never have a skeptic on. Occasionally they'll have on like a, a real archaeologist or art historian or somebody that actually knows something. But they don't they don't ask them to address the particular thing that they're addressing in the show. OK, how did that thing there in South America, at 10,000 feet elevation of Cusco, Machu Picchu, how did that get made? And then that person, well, here's what archaeologists think that that is how it was made. They never do that. They, have, they always have the expert just kind of repeat what the problem is or this was a magnificent site. And here is where it's located. And then they, they go to uh, what's his name with the goofy hair? Yeah, you know, the the guy that says I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. Aliens. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and you know, give us what at least give us what the mainstream scientists think it is, and then go ahead and give us your ancient alien thing. The reason they don't do that, I think, is because they can see that the mainstream explanation is always better than the extraterrestrial explanation, and and there's never, and they never have any positive evidence. Again, it's always. The argument from uh, ignorance or the argument from personal incredulity. I can't imagine how they move those stones so big. They could not have done it through natural means. How do you know? 
And one of the things that uh, you discussed during that podcast, uh, in particular Hancock and Carlson brought up uh, uh, several uh, papers, uh, published papers supporting uh, two things. One was the asteroid or comet impact 13,000 years ago, and there are several publications in science and other top journals. And the other one was the pre-Clovis occupation of America. Yeah, so the, you know, the impact hypothesis, yeah, 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 the impact hypothesis has gathered some more support since then, that, since that podcast. Uh, the, the one you're referring to, by the way, is that the Joe Rogan podcast with Graham Hancock and uh, Carlson and myself. And then we each, we each had our own phone a friend expert. Um, so, yeah, the impact hypothesis at that time was, you know, it was, it was sort of hit and miss. Since then, there's been a few other papers in support, although there are some skeptics. That um, since then, also that um, that find in San Diego, that that week was made that week that Graham Hancock brought up about the mammoth burial mammoth site in San Diego that it was dated at 130,000 years ago. Now the paper claimed that the that the bones were broken in such a way, and there were some rocks around there that might have been stone tools would imply that humans or some kind of hominid <laughs> broke the bones in a way to get to the marrow and and therefore people lived in North America 130,000 years ago. Okay, wow. I mean if that were true, that would completely overturn Clovis. Well, that that is not what the pre-Clovis archaeologists think at all. You know, they think instead of 11 to 13,000 years roughly 13 say uh, it's more like maybe 18 or 20, 22, you know, you sort of push the boundaries depending on the site, plus or minus the error bars on the, uh, the dates, you know, and, and, and that's the challenge. That's the real challenge to Clovis. Since that podcast, there's again, more evidence for pre Clovis. So Clovis is, is probably gone now. Fine. But you know, the, uh, I got, I got hammered for being kind of the defender of the, the orthodoxy as it were. But the reason that orthodoxy was there, it, it was, because of you know almost a century's worth of research to support it. Now that doesn't make the orthodoxy permanently right. Uh, you know, in, in, as Einstein famously said in response to a book called "One Hundred Scientists Against Einstein," he said, "Why do we need a hundred? You know, one would do if if I'm wrong." <laughs> and and that's right. So you know, again, the you know falsification is key, and you know finding older sites. Uh, consistently, particularly as they spread down North America, uh, you know, such that uh, you know the the the, the native uh, initial Americans coming over didn't have to fly down to South America. Uh, you know, so, so, so in other words, there's kind of a, a a tracing record down down the the, the coast or whatever um, to to see how they got to South America with those uh, older aid older dates. Now the impact hypothesis um, is still what part part what's instilled this under dispute is the um, mass extinction of of the, all the native mammals. Uh, there's still some uh, you know, scientists claiming that the impact itself is not enough to explain that because um, not all species went extinct and other species went extinct that were not affected by the impact. So it, at the very least, it's probably overhunting hypothesis and maybe. You know the the weakening of the populations because of the decimation due to the impact, something like that. And and, and there has been a paper published challenging the San Diego um, paper in Nature, uh, and so people can read it and decide. For me, I'm just going to say, you know, I doubt it. That's the ex extraordinary claim. Uh, therefore, we need a lot of evidence to overturn it. Like, where were the people a hundred thousand years ago? Then there should be sites that are 120,000 years old, 115,000 years old, 110,000 years old. In other words, there should be a, a record between here and there. But to jump from these kind of pre-Clovis claims of maybe 20, 25,000 years old to 130,000 years old with nothing in between, that makes me skeptical. And also, when, when uh, it's good to remember that the site was, was uh, discovered because there was a, it was construction with heavy equipment driving over the bones that are in the dirt not far, far below so another hypothesis is that the bones were broken because of the heavy equipment and and the stone tools these are not like these beautifully crafted clovis uh stones that are obviously art artificially produced 
they're just kind of broken in a way that, you know, if you squint and use your imagination, maybe it was made by a person, but, you know, maybe not. And also 130,000 years ago, who would that be? I mean, uh, Neanderthals maybe, or, you know, Denisovians. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now we're off the page of science and we're just kind of speculating. It's fun. Super interesting. I like Graham. By the way, he's a really good writer. His, I like his books. I've read most of his books. And I like that he's there doing that because um, science does need its outsiders. It needs people to challenge the orthodoxy. As long as you're willing to say, usually the outsiders and the challengers, even inside challengers to the orthodoxy are wrong. They're usually wrong. So it's, you know, the reason science is so conservative and careful and cautious is because most ideas that scientists come up with are wrong. You know, they're in the lab, they're just spitballing ideas. And so let's just see what, what we can come up with and then test it and see what happens. Again, back to Einstein, you know, he, he, doesn't, he wasn't world famous until after 1919 when Eddington tested his general theory of relativity with the bending of starlight around the sun during the solar eclipse. Before that, no one knew who Einstein was outside of physics. In physics, he was he was pretty famous, but outside of that, you know, he was nobody. And and he was mostly famous because of those five papers he wrote in two thousand in nineteen oh five uh, that you know proved the existence of molecules and in, uh, in the Brownian motion paper and a few other things that caught the attention of the professional community and it got him a real job. But that that isn't what made him famous. What made him famous was here's an actual experiment that confirmed it exact almost to the perfect exact point that he said it would okay that's what it takes